wherever you are and you're welcome. Welcome to the Nigerian Society of Anesthetists webinar series. This is series number seven, session number three. And today we're going to have another important topic to be presented by one of our own. Uh, it will be presented by uh, the moderator. Now, please, as you join, you should stay muted um, until you are asked to unmute to speak. Uh, some of the in-house rules is that when you come in, you stay muted. Now, the, to guide us through this uh, webinar, the presentation, we have Dr. Ifezwe Uzoma, who is a consultant anesthetist with the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, Idi Araba, Lagos, Nigeria. And uh, she will uh, introduce the speaker for this webinar and guide us through the, the whole session. Dr. Ifezio Uzoma, if you are around, you can unmute and take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dati. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me, sir. Yes, we can. So we're all welcome to today's webinar series. My name is Dr. Ifezue Uzoma. Um, all protocols duly observed. I'm going to, I want to first of all, all thank the ESCO of Nigeria Society of Anesthetists for giving me this opportunity to moderate this webinar. Um, I want to thank my teachers, our professors, senior colleagues and colleagues, and everyone that has made our time to be here today. So um, the presenter for today's webinar series, today is like Dr. Professor Dati said, the series seven, session three, and we're going to take the topic. Um, Hello, can you hear me? Yes. So we're going to take the topic, long ultrasound in, crit in the critically ill, and it's going to be taken by our very own Professor Kingsley, former Toby. I'm going to quickly read the citation um, concerning Dr. Toby before we start. Thank you. Dr. Kingsley Toby is an associate professor and specialist anesthesiologist and critical care physician at the University of Namibia. He's a fellow of both the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria and um, the West African College of Surgeons. He did his post-fellowship training in critical care at the prestigious Apollo Hospital in India. He has authored over 40 scientific publications in local, national, and international journals of repute and has chaptered um, books in some medical textbooks. He's also the author of Questions and Answers in Anesthesia and Intensive Care, and then the ICU Pocket Book. He supervises part two and MMED candidates for the National Postgraduate Medical College and the West African College of Surgeons in the Faculty of Anesthesia, and also at the University of Namibia, Namibia respectively. He's involved in teaching medical students and postgraduate students in both anesthesia and critical care. Join me to welcome Professor Kingsley Ufoma Tobi to have the floor. Thank you. Professor Tobi, sir. Thank you very much. I um, want to thank the president and the ESCO of our great association uh, for this uh, opportunity. And I want to welcome us all. I want to try and share my screen uh, so that we can just um, start um, just a minute. Teresa, can you hear me? I can hear you, please. Okay, you have 40 minutes and then we'll have 20 minutes to take questions. Thank you. All right. 
Thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity without taking much of our time because there's a lot to talk about. So uh, this evening, I have the opportunity, the privilege to uh, present to us long ultrasound scan in the critically ill. All right, we're going to try to follow this uh, outline. We're trying to introduce long ultrasound I will do a little bit of ultrasound machine and the probes and the knobs. I will look at the features of a normal long ultrasound. Then we look at the 10 basic signs of long ultrasound. We we'll look at the blue protocol and stepwise approach to performing a long ultrasound in our patients. And then we'll try to conclude and uh, give a little tribute to one of my mentors, Daniel Leicester, a French intensivist, then I'll present you the references. By way of uh, introduction, uh, clinical ultrasound is as old as in the 19th century when the activities of piezoelectric crystal was first uh, recognized. And clinical ultrasound was later introduced to medicine in the 1940s. Um, in as early as 1960 to 1970, um, ultrasound use was introduced into anesthesia, and um, there are a lot of interest at that point in introducing anesthesia. I mean, ultrasound to anesthetic practice. In the 1990s, the point of ultrasound was introduced to emergency medicine, all right, which enabled the physicians to. Uh, perform rapid bedside assessments and diagnostics, leading to more accurate and timely decision making. In the 2000s, the role of the ultrasound critical care became recognized as a valuable tool for accessing cardiac function, evaluating lung functions, lung conditions, and also aiding in the management of critically ill patients. Yeah, in the, between 1980 and 1990s, ultrasound guided vascular access was popularized. And in the 90s, we have the focus assessment with sonography for trauma, which was an essential tool in trauma care. And point of care ultrasound in recent times has also been found used in resuscitation medicine, where uh, it has become an integral part of resuscitation efforts in cardiac arrest scenarios. All right, a brief, brief um, we look at um, the advantages, so to say, of uh, bedside ultrasound. It um, leads to reduced cost of care, increased image resolution, reduced space requirements, reduced trained personnel, the need for trained personnel, and has helped to reduce human error. And all of this also, especially when time is of essence, has reduced time constraints in the care of the critically in ICU. All right, um, we'll just look a little bit about the instrumentation because uh, performing a long ultrasound uh, requires adequate knowledge of the ultrasound machine itself, how uh, to approach the patient in terms of patient, adequate patient positioning and your probe positioning. It's also important for us to have a good understanding on patient to screen orientation. And we know that um, sound waves travel from the machines as echoes uh, to produce image on the um, tissues and organs on which the sound uh, waves are bought. And the speed of ultrasound through tissues is dependent on the density and content of the tissues. Absorption of ultrasound waves by tissues also depend on the density. For instance, the denser the tissues, the more sound waves are absorbed to produce what we known as uh, hyperechoic uh, features, which are bright, wide, bright images. For instance, bone, which is very dense and diaphragm, we appear bright on ultrasound. We have fluid, which is less dense, we appear as black. All right. So, um, in terms of probe, it's important for us to. Um, have a good knowledge of probe selection. And we have two kinds of probe. It can, uh, probe frequency can either be high or low frequency. High frequency probes, such as the linear probe that we use 
the most of the times we perform local tra local ultrasound produce high resolution but low penetration so it's used for superficial structures while low uh, frequency probes um, uh, have very low resolutions but they penetrate deeper into the structures note that uh, frequency and resolution are inversely related to penetration so the higher frequency probes are used for higher or superficial structures, like I mentioned, while the low frequency probes are used for deeper structures. And um, on the left of the, uh, of the presentation, we have the different frequencies for the different ultrasound probes and what they are applied for. So most of the times we use the linear probes. Sometimes uh, we can use the phased array of cobilinear probes if we are looking at the blobs a point in the posterior chest examination. But as we go on, some of these things will become clearer. But suffice to know that there are two types of probes, frequencies, the high and the low frequency probes. The high frequency are for superficial structures, while the low frequency probes are for deeper structures. Now, this is just to uh, give us the slide on the different uh, probe. Uh, we have the linear probe, we have the covilinear and the fixed array. Covilinear most of the times uh, can be used for abdominal uh, examinations, where the fixed array, also known as the cardiac probes uh, for cardiac structure. Uh, on the right side of the slide, we have the, what we call only one hand head ultrasound probe, which combines all the features of the three common ultrasound probes that we have. And this is what we use especially for the butterfly ultrasound or other handheld ultrasound machines around. All right, in terms of nobology, it's important for us to know what to press, what to use. Uh, when you want to increase brightness of your image, you want to increase the gain, which is on the ultrasound machine. When you want to magnify or zoom on a particular tissue, you use your depth. Motion is actually for measurement and also to uh, look at the dynamic flow. For instance, when the cardiologists want to measure ejection fracture or they want to look at uh, flow through the valves, mitral valve or EOT valve, they go into the M mode. All right, probe orientation and probe marker is important in most of the time, local ultrasound, the probe marker is really pointed to the head of the patient to the right. And don't forget your probe orientation, which could be longitudinal or transverse. Yeah, just a mention of echogenicity. When we're talking about uh, this uh, image is anechoic, hypoechoic, and hypo and hypoechoic. Uh, when we're talking about hypoechoic, we are talking about uh, the structures that look appear brighter than the surrounding tissues because they produce more echoes. And this can indicate a dense or highly refractive structure such as bone or calcified lesion. And this is important, especially when we are looking for spine sign where you need to identify the diaphragm on your log ultrasound. That by coke refers to structures or areas on your ultrasound images that appear darker than the surrounding structures, although they still produce some echoes. And this can indicate a solid or a semi-solid structure with less density or cellularity. Now, long ultrasound, uh, this is where we are. I need to quickly um, just reiterate this. Long ultrasound is a component of POCOS, which is point of care ultrasound scan. And when we're talking about POCOS, um, the, the idea is to answer binary questions, you know, to identify, you know, the presence or absence of disease conditions. You know, so it's not, um, it, it's not, uh, you know, an examination that goes into details. Like when we're talking about cardiac ultrasound and critical ear, we're not like the cardiologist looking for detailed structures of the heart. Same goes for the lung. So. When we're talking about long ultrasound, we want to identify what I'm seeing on my ultrasound. Does it represent a normal lung or are there pathologies that this ultrasound 
can help you to decipher. So language sound is part of focus, which answers binary questions. Is this structure normal? Yes or no? If it's not normal, what are the features that can give it away in your diagnosis? So basically, um, for techniques of laboratory sound, we, like I mentioned, we're going to make use of the linear probe, which you apply to the anterior chest, all right, perpendicular to the ribs. Your probe position to be between the ribs, all right, before now, um, most cardiologists and sonologists to perform your ultrasound until pioneers like Daniel Leichstein and the co uh, began to find a way around it. So for you to have a good examination of the lungs, use your ultrasound, proper proposition is important and your probe should be placed between two ribs at each of the eight quadrants we're going to be talking about as we go on. Now, before you perform log ultrasound, like I told my trainees, you must also, first of all, do the, the, the blue hand maneuver. I don't know if you can see on my screen how you put your, your palm, the palms of your hand, almost at the same size of the patient's hand, all right, the first one just slightly below the, the, the clavicle and the, the thumbs of both hands are kept away. So you have the eight fingers on the anterior chest wall. This is important to avoid the heart in especially when you are you, 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 you want to do a uh, perform so that lose the love ultrasound. So the, 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 the center of the upper palm of the hand is the upper blue point and the center of the lower palm, the lower hand is the lower blue point. And this is important as we go on because it helps to orientate your, your ultrasound probe in your examination. So this is what we call blue hand maneuver and is very useful for us almost all the time to perform the blue hand maneuver before you start your ultrasound. Another thing that is important is the plus point. We're going to see that as it relates to eliciting pleural fusion and some uh, interstitial edema. The plus point that which refers to the posterior lateral alveolar and pleural syndrome point, all you know, right, is an intersection. If you look at it from here, is a line that is drawn, all right, from the lower blue point to the posterior as a line, this is the posterior as line, the intersection between the lower blue point, like I mentioned before, and the posterior as a line is the plus point. And this is where you put your probe, especially when you want to look out for pleural effusion and also examine the diaphragm for spine sign. All right, so basically, um, there are 10 basic signs of the long ultrasound, and the, we're going to be looking at it as we go on in subsequent slide. That's what we call the bad sign, all right? The bad sign I'm going to show us as we go on. Uh, we have the A lines, the B lines. We're going to look for long sliding, the quad sign, and um, we also look at um, the stress sign, the tissue-like sign, long point, backcode sign and stratophile sign. These are uh, things we're going to see in subsequent uh, slide. For instance, the bad sign, when you put your probe, your linear probe on the second intercostal space, immediately below the clavicle, you will see what looks like a bad wing sign. This is a bad, all right? And this is on the left of the screen you will see these anechoic structures, all right? And this, and you'll see the plural line, which is anechoic line, which is a horizontal line. So you'll see that, and you'll see the, 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 the rib shadows extending from the superior part down. So uh, to make it brighter, you can see this is the plural line, 
The rape shadows going down represent a bad sign. So before you make any interpretation of any findings on your log of the sun, you want to ensure that you are able to elicit this bad sign from the onset. All right, so the A lines, these are horizontal lines, almost equidistant from the plural line. Uh, okay, the plural line is the uh, accentuation of um, your parietal and the viscera plural. All right, so the A lines are horizontal, equi almost equidistant from one another. And what it shows is that it shows a normal aviated lung. So when you see A lines in your lung ultrasound feed, it shows a normal aerated lungs. All right. Um, the B lines, the B lines are abnormal lines. They are longitudinal lines that arise from the plural line. You can see they are longitudinal. Uh, you know, as opposed to the horizontal lines of the A line, the B lines, and you can see the number of B lines is very diagnostic, but the presence of B lines on you know, your long ultrasound uh, indicates a wet lung, all right? And it's usually uh, depends on uh, the number of A lines, you, I mean, the B lines you can see. On the left side, these are B lines about one, two, three, four. On this side, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven A lines, I mean, B lines. So the number of bill lines will tell you uh, the severity of pulmonary edema. All right, there are some seven key criteria for B lines. They look like comet tears. These are celestial bodies that when they uh, get close to the sun, they emit uh, very uh, high uh, intensity lights. All right, they are vertical, all right, in contrast to the horizontal A lines. They also arise from the plural line and they move with long sliding, all right? They shoot down to the bottom of the screen. They do not... And sometimes the number, the higher the number of B lines, they may actually obliterate the appearance of A lines. When you have severe massive pulmonary edema, it will be difficult for you to pick up A lines because the B lines obliterate them. So they are called comatase. They are also we known it as uh, the rocket sign. For instance, those days when we're younger and you see aeroplane, you know, flying on this on the sky. After the aeroplane, you see what looks like smoke. All right. That is what the B lines look like on long ultrasound. And I'm going to show you as we go on the importance of some of, some of these. Because of nomenclature, we have what we call C lines. These are not true lines per se, uh, but they are uh, features that are consistent with uh, long consolidation. So since we have A lines, which are horizontal, we have vertical lines, which are B lines. Then there's these C lines, which are hyperechoic subplural focal images. Uh, that are generated from condensed lung tissue, all right, without any visceral pleural line gap. What it means is that the, 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 there is no separation between the visceral and pleural line, and there's some, you know, uh, what looks like uh, hypochromic focal images. They are not, like I mentioned, they are not uh, true lines, but for the sake of um, consistency, we just call them um, C lines. But anytime you see, you are able to decipher C lines. On your lower ultrasound, you may must also look for other features of lung consolidation in, in, in the patient. All right, another very important sign is the long sliding. All right, long sliding, you need to look for long sliding. The presence of long sliding shows a normal lung. And what does, what does long sliding mean is the shimmering. If you put your probe there, you see the shimmering movement all right, of the lungs over the pleura. It represents the friction between the lung surface and the pleura surface. So my, my young doctors there, we call it matching ants. They're like matching ants. It's moving, it's shivering with inspiration and expiration. The presence of lung sliding shows normal lung. 
But in some instances, like neurotourists, and that we need to emphasize on as we go on, there's absence of long sliding. You don't see that shimmering or gliding movement of the viscera and the pleural line. You don't see that. So it's static. And the presence of long point, this is long point. In some cases, you see long sliding and you see the point that switch no, long sliding no longer exists. So the point between long sliding and no long sliding is what we call long point. And if you are able to identify a long point on ultrasound, it's almost more than 99% diagnostic of pneumothorax. And it's something you can readily pick by the bedside instead of waiting for chest surgery or or your CT scan. And once you see it, it also shows you the severity of the pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax that may cause hemodynamic instability requiring immediate intervention. The quad sign, the quad sign is a sign sometimes may be difficult to appreciate for the neophyte, for the newcomer in long ultrasound, but it's basically a quad, a quadrilateral angle all right, that um, comprised of the rib shadows that I mentioned before when I was talking about the Batwick sign, the parietal pleura on top, the visceral pleura, and you will see there's a gap there, and this is the quartz sign. The quartz sign is pathognomy of pleural effusion. When you see this, you want to We call it the ground glass rocket. So it's the whitening of the long surface. Now, what happened? Another way to know, to be sure this is pulmonary edema, if you do a diuretic challenge or full semi, you will see that the number of the B lines will reduce automatically. And that shows you that this patient is in pulmonary edema. All right, like I mentioned, uh, the severity. My pulmonary edema, you have two to three B lines, all right? So, okay, let's start from here. When you have A lines plus one or, plus one or my no B line, it shows a normal aeration pattern. So there's no pulmonary edema. There's no need of doing uh, forced diuresis. When you have two to three B lines, is is significant of my pulmonary edema. But when you have more than four or five B lines, it shows moderate to severe pulmonary edema. And this is where diuretic challenge should be aggressive. But when you have a complete whiteout, you know, there's no A lines, the B lines have obliterated the A lines, you are in very severe pulmonary edema and your patient will require aggressive diuretic therapy. Sometimes you may end up giving this patient dialysis. LDS, which is very common in the uh, in critical care setting, all right, can also be diagnosed with your long ultrasound. What you see, you see your that fused bilateral comet is the B lines, all right. This is an ARDS. How do we know this ARDS? There's a complete bilateral comet is the B lines are there, but when you do a direct challenge, there's no reduction in the B lines. So this, and it, it makes sense if you look at the pathophysiology of ARDS, is edema, pulmonary edema of non-cardiogenic origin. So diuresis will not affect the presence of the B lines here. So when you see multiple B lines, the diffuse comatase pattern without any reduction in the B lines upon diuretic challenge, your patient most likely is in LDS. And don't forget, like I mentioned, long ultrasound is like focus and it seeks to answer binary questions. You want to make a diagnosis, is my patient in LDS? Remember, there are all the features of LDS that must come into play. But on long ultrasound, you see these diffuse B lines that will not change with your diuresis. Pulmonary embolism also can be diagnosed with long ultrasound. 
Here, you will see that there are no B lines, okay? Okay, now there's present long sliding, then you will do your uh, venous ultrasound, all right, your DVT. And when you're able to see there's a DVT on your uh, venous ultrasound, it's part of going of pulmonary embolism. Sorry, Prof. Tony, we have 10 more minutes. Thank you. Oh, 10 more minutes. I need to run now. It's, okay, let's let's go. So, pleural fusion and hemothorax is important, especially as a cause of um, cardiac decompensation in our patient. And what we look for is what we call the spine sign. On a normal ultrasound, this is the spine, this is the diaphragm. So, when you see this spine, this is the spine. Remember that you look for the liver, especially on the uh, posterior alveolar points, like I mentioned before. When you see this, this is the diaphragm, the hypoechoic structure here, all right, the, between the lungs and the liver. And you see, this is the spine, this, the, the, the vertebral spine. But when you see, in case of pleural effusion or, or fluid field cavity in the lung, the, the spine, the, the transmission of sound waves goes beyond the, the diaphragm. So any spine sign beyond the diaphragm is a diagnostic of pleural effusion. And also you will have a loss of mirror image. When we talk about mirror image artifact, it is when you know, a, an artificial image is produced by another image from a reflective surface. So you'll see loss of mirror image in the right upper quadrant, all right? And once you see spine sign, you just put your uh, page, uh, the machine on your air mode and you see the sign, sinusoidal sign on your air mode. This patient most likely, more than 90% has pleural effusion that may require drainage. All right, okay, I'll leave that. These are other signs that I mentioned before. All right, the blue protocol as popularized by Daniel Lachenstein is something we use commonly in our surgical ICU here in Vindu. All right, what the blue protocol does is helps us to diagnose the five common causes of respiratory failure. A patient is a respiratory failure. You want to know what is the cause. The first one is pulmonary edema. You look for multiple B lines, like I described earlier, and there's presence of log, sun, log, log sliding, and the B lines reduce with your directed challenge. This patient has pulmonary edema. In the end, yeah, pulmonary embolism as a cause of respiratory failure. You see A lines, no B lines, and there's evidence of DVT from your venous ultrasound, all right? That shows you this patient has pulmonary embolism as a cause of the respiratory failure. Pneumothorax, there will be air lines, but no lung sliding, and you are able to identify the lung point. Asthma or COPD as a cause of respiratory failure, you see air lines, no B lines, lung sliding. Pneumonia as a cause of respiratory failure, you will see presence of air lines, with the stress signs or the bumping plural that I mentioned before. Oh, this is the practical point of it. I hope I can do this in less than 10 minutes. All right, so um, this is step by long ultrasound. The patient position is very key. The patient, uh, most of the times in the IC, they are lying supine, and you want to lift the hands of the patient up to be able to expose the lungs for better view. Sometimes you may need to put the patient's hand behind their head and your transducer, select your transducer. Most of the time I like to use the linear ultrasound, uh, the linear pro because the lung is superficial and um, you want to put your, um, what's it called, your machine in the lung or your abdominal preset. And you place the machine on the patient right side. And if you're a right-handed person and you do whatever you want to do with your right hand, and don't forget that the approach marker should be towards the patient's head as you manipulate downwards from the anterior chest to the lateral and to the posterior chest wall. There are six points you must always start from the both sides, the right and the left side, the anterior chest, you start mid-clavicular, lead slightly inferior to the mid-clavicular line. The second intercostal space, you move down to the fourth intercostal space, the sixth intercostal space, 
Then you go to the posterior chest, all right, the fourth intercostal space, and the, the, the eighth intercostal space, and the tenth intercostal space. These are the progression. You move from here, I don't know if you can see my arrow, you move from here, go to the lateral chest or the posterior chest wall, and this can be done in a swift in two to five minutes. All right, okay. So uh, the proposition right and left, look always examine both right and left side of the chest. So the R1 and L1 is right one, right two is anterior to anterior superior. R2 to L2 is the lateral examination of the lateral chest wall and L3 to L3 that is right and left is the blast point where you look at the posterior inferior part of the lungs. All right, so this is the linear ultrasound probe. Uh, you can see that the probe marker is pointed towards the patient's right or towards the patient's head. And you, in, in point one, which is your, there's a new motor or interstitial edema. Point the probe towards the patient's head and you move the probe at its second intercostal space respectively. Make sure that your probe is anchored in between the ribs because the ribs, sorry, the ribs can be an impediment for, for your uh, examination. So ensure that your probe is in between two ribs. The second one is the point two, the right and left point two. You place the probe at the right or left mid axillary line, mid axillary line, around the sixth to several intercostal space. And this is the lipo, so this is your bilateral to the lipo. And here you are looking for the bat wing sign I mentioned before. You look for long sliding at this point and you look for A lines. Also do a long slide, you can appreciate long sliding from point one. Point three, this Doctor, is important. Sorry, Dr. Toby. We can yes. spare, I think we can spare an extra five minutes so that you can finish up, thank you. Okay, thank you. So yeah, the, the point three, the post examination of the posterior chest wall, all right, this is where you look for pleural effusion and consolidation. So what you do is that, like I mentioned before, if you remember the upper blue point, oh, the upper blue point when you put your two palms on the patient anterior chest and the lower blue point, all right, and you come, you do your posterior axillary line, the point where your lower blue point, all right, means is where your probe should be, posterior axillary line, and this is where your plus point is. Sometimes your hand can also be on the patient's bed for better probe orientation. And at this point, you may see what we call the cutting sign. What it means that during inspiration, uh, the lungs, you know, get inflated and the intra-abdominal organs like the liver and the spleen are, are, are covered. During the expiration, the lungs move away. You see the lung, the liver, and the underlying structure. That's what we call the cutting sign. At this point, also, you should be able to appreciate the spine sign, which is a prolongation of your spine sign beyond the, 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 the diaphragm, which shows that there are some fluid collections in that lung space. All right, so uh, this is your liver here. This is your right kidney, and you look for the for the for the diaphragm. This is the spine. Anything beyond any, if you see this spine beyond this level of diaphragm, is positive long sign. I mean, spine sign, which is part of part of gothic of your pleural effusion. All right, these are things. Uh, I'm sure if we have the uh, opportunity to look at the slide, you can do this. All right, this is where air probogram is something I quickly want to mention here, you know, especially at the point three of your posterior chest examination. We know air probograms can also uh, be seen from your chest x ray and CT scan. But it's important in long ultrasound because you can differentiate between dynamic air probograms and static air probograms. And what it means is that this is consolidation. When you see ear bronchograms, that is, you know, hyperechoic structure and means some less echoic structure, it shows that ear is trapped within those bronchi. And if this move with respiration, if you see ear bronchogram move with respiration, 
is diagnostic of pneumonia. But if the air bronchogram does not move with respiration, it shows that there is an obstruction, whether maybe atelectasis and all that. So the air bronchogram does not move with respiration, it's more of atelectasis. A long ultrasound score was actually popularized during the COVID era in order to, pro, uh, to predict mortality. And you examine the lungs on 12 lung regions on both sides, and you put the sum together, which ranges from zero to 13. Zero point is when you are able to identify your lung sliding with A lines, with minimal B lines is zero. When you have the moderate loss of the aeration, with three to four B lines or center rockets or rocket sign, you give that patient one on that point, all right? And two points when there are more than five or more B lines, all right, that patient, that score gives you two on that long segment. When you have presence of hypoechoic, poorly defined tissue, suggestive of consolidation, you give that region of the lung three points. A long ultrasound scale part of, of 12, more than 12 predicted adverse outcome with a specificity and sensitivity of 90 to 91 respectively. So these are things we can actually adopt, you know, in our long ultrasound and give scores to our patient in terms of, um, um, you know, prognostication. Yes, this is my mentor in Logo Drew Sound. I'd like to give a tribute to him. He's a French uh, intensivist and pioneer in the field of critical care ultrasound. Um, he's, he's widely recognized for his significant contributions to the development and popularization of Logo Drew Sound. This was an era where cardiac and sonologists uh, were very scared of Logo Drew Sound because they felt that the lung was an impediment to Logo Drew Sound. And recently we had a communication and this is the image sent to me. And I feel that this is a guy that we can actually work with. Thank you very much uh, for your time. I hope I've been able to share one or two things on local ultrasound. Thank you. Thank you very Dr. much, Dr. Toby. Thank you so much, Dr. Toby, for the elaborate um, lecture. I'm sure we've gained one or two things today. So please, if you have any questions, kindly put it up in the chat box, or if you want to um, speak, you can raise your hand. I'll just quickly summarize on what... what um... Hello? Please mute your mic um, as we take questions. I'll, I'll quickly summarize what um, Prof. Sotobi has talked about, started with the history of ultrasound, he now went down to talk about um, from the 1960s to the 2000s, from when the vascular access started in the 80s to the 90s and the 2000s when POCUS was um, elaborated. Then during the COVID era, critical care and then ultrasonography came, um, became more handy for anesthetists and intensive care physicians. Then he went about to talk about the advantages of ultrasound how it reduces the cost, reduces time constraints, reduces human error. And then he talked about the ultrasound machine itself, how you orient patient orientation and positioning, talked about probe selection from the linear probe, the curvilinear probe. And then he talked about the frequency and resolution, how low frequency will help us with deeper structures and high frequency will help us with them, locating superficial structures. Then he talked about the phase phased um, array ultrasound, the probe that is used for cardiac structures. And then the all-in-one, all -one, the butterfly, which is a handheld held one, the, that he talked about um, the normal long, what we can see on normal long ultrasound. He talked about different lines first, then the long sliding, then the four key things you should be able to see on normal long ultrasound, the long sliding, the A lines, the seashore on M mode, and then the bat sign. Then he talks about some of the common pathologies in long ultrasound, from pulmonary edema to pneumonia, to acute respiratory distress syndrome, and then to pleural effusion. Then he mentioned the blue protocol, which means the bedside long ultrasound in emergency, which helps us to also diagnose um, quickly 
the common pathologies like pulmonary edema, pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, asthma or COPD, and then pneumonias. Um, he also went to the practical session to talk about the six points in lung ultrasound from the anterior, from the second intercostal, so he went down to the posterior area and then to the eighth up to the tenth intercostal space. Then he talked about air bronchogram, the lung ultrasound areas, especially during the COVID period that helped in diagnosis, and then he summarized. So I don't know um, if you have any questions, I'll check the chat box so that we can take the questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Toby. Okay, I'll start with the, I hope you can hear me, please. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yes. So I'll, I'll start with the most recent question. Thank you for this amazing presentation. Long ultrasound and chest x-ray, which is more preferable in case of pulmonary embolism in, in emergency cases? All right, am I to answer how I say wait? Yes, please. I think you should answer. So. But I, I, you know, except you have mobile x-ray, long ultrasound comes handy. And it's it's quicker, all right. And it has a very high uh, specificity and sensitivity. So I rather uh, go for it. But in times, especially when you have a patient who has been in ICU for some time, you have mobile x-ray. There's nothing stopping you from using it too. But like I mentioned to so, uh, my young doctors, my trainees, if I have an ABG machine and the ultrasound in the ICU, I can be do without any other investigation. So uh, in terms of pulmonary embolism, uh, long ultrasound comes very handy and it's easy to detect on long ultrasound. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Toby. I don't seem to find other questions on the chat box. Please, can someone help out? Okay, there's another question now from Usman Mohammed. Thank you for your presentation. Regarding positioning, what if the patients can lie down? Is sitting position an option? Definitely, yes. You can you can do ultrasound in sitting position for your patient. Definitely. Okay, thank you. Are there any contraindications? Okay, this is from Omar Kone. An anesthetist from Senegal, you're welcome. Are there any contraindications to long ultrasound? There is no known no contraindications to long ultrasound. Now, number one is non-invasive. So there is practically non, no known contraindications to long ultrasound. The only thing maybe is um, if a patient, I mean, if you do not have a trained personnel, but as it is, there is no known contraindications to long ultrasound. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's a was... question. Okay. So there's a question there, whether you've seen it. Somebody, Ali Hyder, says, is there a role mm -hmm. for. Hello? 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 Check Ali Hyder. There is a question there. Um, I just, I'm just trying to locate it again. Thank you. Let me check. Okay, is there a role? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I've seen it now. Yes. Is there a role? Thank you for your presentation, sir. Is there a role for Doppler and ultrasound in long ultrasound? Are there any features that suggest pulmonary hypertension? Yeah, well, uh, long ultrasound has not been known to help in diagnosing pulmonary hypertension. Um, you know, there are other. Uh, modalities for diagnosing the only thing ultrasound can do um, is, is like an adjuvant, all right? Maybe to look for, and it's going to be more of, um, you know, a cardiac thing, you know, cardiac um, decompensation from your um, pulmonary hypertension, but there is no uh, protocol for uh, using long ultrasound in the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, as far as I'm aware. Okay, thank you. Since ultrasound is almost replacing the stethoscope, this is from Aquasi. 
do you suggest we on, incorporate ultrasound in medical school curriculum? Definitely, definitely. There are, uh, there are uh, medical schools right now that's ultrasound, the introduction to ultrasound. And I think it's something that should be incorporated. And whereas I belong to um, um, analog stage, I belong to analog generation. I still believe I still use my stethoscope, but I think ultrasound should be incorporated. Apart from uh, its usefulness in log ultrasound, there are other things, cardiac, obstetrics, also, you know, in anesthesia, uh, prefer uh, nerve blockage guide, uh, ultrasound guidance, vascular access, you know, ultrasound guidance. So uh, it's something that we should be introduced to as early as medical school, in fact, from year one, it should be part of the curriculum. Thank you. My opinion, anyway. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Toby. Um, there's another question. Just give me some minutes. What, with what level of sensitive certainty can you diagnose urinary embolism with ultrasound? It's more than 95%. What level of certainty? You know, because it's in it. You know, don't forget that uh, pulmonary embolism is, um, all, you know, it, it, it's, you must also do your venous ultrasound, all right? Okay. So uh, rule out. Everybody. Um, every medical officer, every doctor in my unit has been trained in long ultrasound and cardiac ultrasound. So we do it regularly. And I believe that the leadership of uh, NSC um, anti is here. I'm sure that uh, it's something that can be arranged in the nearest future. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if there are any other questions. I can't see I, I can't see any hand raised on the yes page. Yes, we can see that. Um, maybe we okay. There's a hand there, Solomon. Solomon, Solomon why? Why? Yes. Please unmute and talk, Solomon. Solomon, Solomon, why? Please, you can unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Oh, okay, uh, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, that was quite interesting. Actually, I was wondering about the pulmonary embolism aspect of it. So, uh, like to what extent, to what certainty can you actually like be sure of your diagnosis with the lung of ultrasound of pulmonary embolism? Um, because it is not, I don't know uh, from what I know. So I'm surprised that you can say so categorically that you can, because I was thinking that uh, probably uh, you have to do um, like uh, an echo, a thoracic echo to look at uh, either the subsidiary or to look at the four chambers or the apical four chambers to see the relationship between the LV and the ROV, you know, which is an indirect issue. I'm not aware. So that's why I wanted some clarity. Thank you. I, I think I heard Toby mentioning that 95%. I think your yes, question you was read, and I think he answered in the affirmative. He said 95%. Is that so anything 95, more, Toby, you want to say? Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, that is 95% without. Uh, uh, without any additional test, like um, like for example, if you do a CTPA, mm -hmm. you can see it right away. You know, you don't need anything. No, nothing helps you. But uh, ultrasound, do you need any auxiliary test? Is ultrasound alone enough to diagnose it? Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Solomon. I I understand and um, yeah, the angle of the question. Uh, I, I'm trying to. I was trying to just go back to the presentation. Uh, there are two other things. In, in ultrasound alone, a lot of times when we I do ultrasound in the ICU, uh, especially for pulmonary embolism, 
Once I'm able to rule out the other causes of respiratory failure, and my uh, venous ultrasound is positive and there's DVT, we just look at the right side heart of the heart. We can just, you know, a lot of times, like I tell my people, we can do both long ultrasound and cardiac ultrasound on the same patient. So the, 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 the what's the word now? The certainty actually improves significantly um, when you combine your long ultrasound with your uh, cardiac ultrasound and looking at the Marconi sign and all that, you know, especially with um, the hyperdynamic state of the uh, superior parts of the right heart, you know, the right ventricle. But having said that, like I said, a lot of times, you know, if you want to do the CTPA and all that, you know, moving the patient from the ICU to the CT room and all that, I find it sometimes very cumbersome. But with uh, a positive DVT on your lung, I mean, on your uh, venous ultrasound, and with the absence of B lines, you are almost sure uh, we can confirm that. But more than 90% of the time, you are able to combine your lung ultrasound and do, you know, like what you said, your Epica four chambers, even with your, uh, what's it called, your, um, Probably Epica two chambers too. Probably. Yes, you can do Epica two chamber from your parasitic short as is. You know, you can look at the right uh, ventricles and combining both actually increases your chances of picking up pulmonary embolism. Thank you, Solomon. Yeah, thank you so much, Prof. I think uh, that answered my questions perfectly well because. Uh, I know that uh, looking at the right side of the uh, of the heart really um, helps, definitely, especially if you are in the ICU, ICU where you don't want to move the patient mm -hmm. up and down and there's no time. Thank you, bro. Great one. God bless Thank you. you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. There's another question. Um, does long ultrasound, okay, long ultrasound can be challenging in an obese patient. Are there some tips to perform it better? Yes, there are two, you know, the long ultrasound is not something that can be covered in the session. There are specific uh, conditions where it can be challenging, like you said, in the obese patient, uh, like, like, you know, in the, 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 the size of the breast. So a lot of times what we do, the first thing you need to do is proper positioning and for obese patient, you want to use the lower frequency probe, all right, because of the adipose tissue covering the anterior chest, your linear probe may not be able to penetrate deeper because it has a high frequency and low uh, penetration. So you want to, number one, position your patient adequately. If your patient can sit or if your patient can lie down, remove the, put the hands up, like I mentioned, proper probe selection. I want to use a covalinear probe even though it's not uh, the ideal one, but because of that, the constitution covering the anterior chest, I want to use a covalinear probe. And sometimes you may struggle here and there, but with expertise, proper positioning, take your probe to covalinear probe and, you know, do a proper chest um, exposure. You know, you may be able to get around it. And don't forget, like I said, long ultrasound is like focus. What it does is answer binary question, is this long number or not? Is there any more thorough? You are just going there looking out for uh, stuff that will help you to make a diagnosis. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you, sir. I don't know if there are any other questions. Yeah, um, I, I think we should move on to, we have uh, notable figures here that we want to say one or two things. Um, Madam President, with your permission, please, I want to, because this is a topic on critical care, we have, um, I want to quickly take the view of uh, Professor Babatunde Oshinaiki, who is the president of the Intensive and Critical Care Society of Nigeria. Dr. Oshinaiki, please. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Dati. Uh, for the opportunity. I want to say thank you to Toby for the great delivery 
of this topic. Uh, just want to mention that uh, in the last workshop we had in May in Lagos, this uh, the members who attended. So I want to say this is something we'll do from time to time. So I want to assure uh, members and other uh, members of NSA that you can benefit from this training that we'll be doing from time to time. with from time to do. Um, in UCH, we have been using this in our ICU, and we've had a um, couple of papers on uh, use of ultrasound, even in some specific uh, condition like uh, plural ultrasound, uh, plural effusion, pneumothorax, we've tried to compare, and we found that ultrasound seems to be very good when it comes to pneumothorax, when it comes to plural effusion. Uh, in the ICU when you compare it with chest history. So I think something that we should, I mean, get into to use now in our ICUs, I am sure it is going to save us a lot of stress. For example, getting uh, portable X-rays in ICUs are somehow, sometimes difficult. It could be that you don't have portable X-ray or, or <laughs> it's faulty. So with your portable ultrasound, you can get to do this uh, quick, exam for the chest and look at the lungs and you can take decision whether you want to start direct therapy or you want to do i mean and provide an urgent i mean urgent uh, care like uh, treating pneumothorax we can kill very fast so i i want to say that this is a very important uh, topic though it's more of a critical care topic but all the same it would be good for our i mean uh, uh, our colleagues who are uh, anesthetists all over the world, all over Africa, to benefit from this uh, uh, area of ICU care. So thank you, Dr. Toby, once again, for that excellent delivery. And thank you, Dr. Dati, for inviting me to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Shinaike. I, um, the Chairman, Local Organizing Committee of the Gombe 2023, that's the annual general meeting of the NSA uh, in November, is drawing our attention to the fact that point of care ultrasound scan is part of Gombe 2023 NSA, so we shouldn't miss it. Um, there are notable figures from all over Africa. I think I will allow the Madam President to call them if they wish to speak, to say something. We always want to draw some lesson we want to be advised on how best to deliver this webinars as always so madam president please over to you thank you yeah thank you very much um dr Deity, for this um opportunity you have given um the entire members of the nigerian society of anesthetists and um, as many as are present today from all over um, africa to be part of this session I must start first by thanking um, Dr. Toby once again for your commitment to the um, society. You are not in Nigeria, but you are very much in Nigeria in different um, 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 parameters. You know, you are associated with us in different spheres. So thank you for loving us and um, thank you for your continued impartation pledge in different ways to the body of anesthetists and intensivists in Nigeria, um, Dr. Toby. Um, I would like to recognize persons here. Uh, I want to start with um, the, um, pre the um, president of the G4 Alliance, um, Dr. Bissola Onojo Bembe, who is in our midst here. She's so excited to have this session a, a quick word from you, Dr. Nojo Bebe, please. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you very much for this webinar. Thanks to all the participants and um, all those who have put this together. I, I 
appreciate what you're doing. And um, I see we've really come a long way from where we started. We're getting better and better, stronger and stronger. And I wish you all the best. And um, I want you to know that the Nigerian Society of Anesthetists is one of the organizations of the Global Alliance for Surgery, Obstetrics, Trauma and Anesthesia Care. And um, it's because of NSA that I'm occupying this seat as the uh, permanent um, council representative representing Nigeria. And uh, I have this wonderful opportunity to be the president of the G4 Alliance. So this is all because of NSA and um, it's, it's, it's really blessed to be part of this growing family. So thanks, uh, Dr. Briggs, and um, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Onokjubimbe. I must once again thank members of the Critical Care. They have always been closely supporting um, our team of anesthetists, um, NSA. And I must say that um, we are happy to be working as a team, um, not only with you, um, members of intensive and critical care, but also all other um, associations in Nigeria, like um, the Society of, um, of um, Specialists in Airway Management, and also um, the Society of Obstetric Anesthesiologists. Before we continue, Continue. I want to recognize the presence of um, Dr. Ken Adegoke. I think he's still here. He's also a member of the Intensive and Critical Care um, Society of Nigeria. Thank you for um, um, being very committed to the cause of the Nigerian anesthetist. I'm aware you have been a diasporian. Can you please quick give us a quick word? We are always happy to have you standing by us in all that we do. Dr. Kenneth Adegoke, please. Okay, um, we, we don't waste too much time. Um, I also want to recognize here um, Professor Ogolinwaso, who has been so passionate about education of, of the, of the um, anesthetists. Um, a quick quote from you, former president of Nigerian Society of Anesthetists, Professor Ogolinwaso. Oh, no, not, uh, not really. Uh, nothing really, Madam President. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, to Thank speak. You. I just want to commend uh, the speaker, uh, the presenter. It was a very detailed uh, presentation. And uh, so far, I think it's very important for us even to add this knowledge to our momentarium to what to do for our patients in the ICU. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Professor Antikusi from Kumasi, Ghana. You're also a friend, a very good friend of the Nigerian Society of Anesthetists. You have, through your passion of um, 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 regional anesthesia, supported Nigerian anesthetists. Please, a word from you. You're welcome to this session. Professor Antikusi, please. I'm not sure he's still with us, Professor Antikusi. Okay. Um, I think we have to um, save some time and move on. Um, maybe he has, no, he's still a Professor Antikusi, are you there? I can still see you're still on board. All right. Maybe once you're ready, you um, say a word. So having said that, we have quite a number of um, anesthetists from the Canexa um, in um, 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 East Africa, Central Africa and South Africa. We want to really appreciate you for um, being here with us. We, um, we are glad to have you. Dr. Sipuka Ndaba, Dr. Edwin Lugazia, Dr. Sweetbart, Dr. Ntabwe, please forgive me if I'm not pronouncing that, Dr. Sanga. We are very happy to have you here with us. Um, anesthetists from Kasexa, which is the um, group of anesthetists in Southern um, East Africa, South Africa, and Central Africa. You are all welcome there. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Professor Fola Fapanle, we also appreciate you. A quick word from you, please. Okay. All right. Um, I think we have had a very rewarding time. We would not want to keep you all waiting. I know you all um, love us and love this um, initiative. Without wasting too much time, I want to just call um, the PRO to give us some quick information about um, activities lined up 
um, for us in the um, Nigerian Institute and I said, Dr. Shelley, please. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Um, I want to once again thank everyone for keeping faith with us and joining us in this webinar. And we want to quickly intimate us with our upcoming events. Uh, our NST OGM will be coming up on the 29th, July 2023. That's next week, Saturday, a week from now. The time is 5 p.m. and the venue is Zoom platform. The NSA AGM and Scientific Conference will be coming up in Gombe on the 27th of November to 1st of December 2023. Let's plan and be there. Let's plan to be there. And then the World Congress of Anesthesiology, WCA 2024, will be coming up on 12th to 7th March 2024 in Singapore. And the All African Anesthesia Congress will be coming up on the 13th to 19th of September 2024 at South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Oshele. Um, finally, I would like to um, say thank you to you also, um, Dr. Rum Kiadeshi, your president of the Society of Specialists in Airway Management. Thank you for always. Um, um, without wasting time, I want to thank you all. Please remember to keep a date with us at the OGM. We, do, we want to hear from you. We want to hear you tell us how far we have done. And we also want to present our activities to you as a, as a team. So please um, keep a date with us next Saturday. So our webinar for next, next Saturday will be, will be uh, instead of the webinar, it will be the OGM. So please um, join us and um, let's talk together. Let's have a a tete a tete on how we have been fearing. And please don't forget, we are also having an election for the uh, fair officer. We need to have a welfare officer as a, as a society to help to cater for all our needs. So um, without um, saying too much again, I want to greet you all and thank you so very much uh, for all that you are doing, you know, to, because we, are, we, we can't have this gathering if you don't keep it dead. So we appreciate you and we say you all should have a very weekend and God or thank you and goodbye. Yes, I can see, um, okay, our um, G4 Alliance president is reminding us of Singapore um, in um, 2024. And please note, we are planning um, a group um, 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 delegation to Singapore. So we'll be putting up notifications to that effect. So please um, get yourself prepared if you are interested in going to um, Singapore. NSA would like to organize a group um, um, delegation to Singapore. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone, and have a lovely weekend. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.